afternoon and welcome to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg and we're live for an hour each weekday afternoon so that we can talk together if you want to call in uh, with any questions you might have about the Bible or the Christian faith, we can discuss those. Uh, if you see things differently from the host, you can call in and we can discuss that as well. And uh, the number to call is 844-484-5788. That's 844-484-5737. If you'd like to be on the program, we would be glad to uh, to have you join us today. Um, we have some calls in we're going to go to right away. And that's, first of all, is going to be from Dwight in Denver, Colorado. Dwight, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi, Steve. Uh, yes, my question is, um, do you have an opinion on letter to the American church by Eric Metaxas? Well, I listened to the audio book. Um, I like Eric Metaxas just fine. Um, uh, his book was mainly, it seemed like it was mainly based on parallels he saw between America at its present time and the time where Nazism was rising in Germany. And uh, he felt like the church in Germany was too apathetic or too cowardly to speak up and to resist it. And that the church uh -huh. in Germany, had they taken a more robust stance against Nazism, might have prevented the disasters that happened there and World War II. Um, and I don't say I disagree. You know, I don't, I don't know to what degree uh, the danger is the same, but it seems not too different. Uh, so, I mean, I, I don't have a, an objection to it. Um, I don't remember anything in his book that I strongly disagreed with. You know, when I listen to or read somebody else's book, I'm mainly just trying to fi find out what his main thesis is. And it's, I'm more concerned about whether I agree with his main thesis than if I disagree with or disagree with every little point made. So I, a lot of times the things I might not fully agree with don't stick in my mind just because it's not important to me. That's, I'm not reading the book to find fault with it. I'm reading the book to find out what the man has to say. And I felt like it was a, it was a book of value. Have you read it? No, I saw the recent movie. And, and my question was, uh, uh, Jesus or Paul, uh, I don't see them speaking out against Rome, do you? Well, they don't speak out against Rome, uh, it's true, but Paul did reason with, uh, with Felix about righteousness and the judgment to come and things like that, and who was a government official. Um, you know, it's true, the Christians did not make it their primary uh, interest to reshape Roman politics on the island of uh, uh, Crete, no, Cyprus, excuse me, on the island of Cyprus, Paul and Barnabas you know, converted a man who was a governor of the island, and we don't know to what degree they gave him instructions to continue his governing according to biblical norms, but they certainly must not have been silent since he was now a Christian operating in, a, in the Roman government. Uh, Paul also talked about in Philippians, how that a number of people from Caesar's household in Rome apparently had been converted through his efforts, but we don't. He doesn't discuss their political activities, but it would be obvious that if a person is uh, uh, in government authority uh, and becomes a Christian, that would be intended to change the way that they govern, uh, right. unless unless as a non-Christian they were already following justice. See, I, Secular governments should only follow justice. They don't. They shouldn't institute religion. That's. I mean, I don't believe that God ever intended for Christianity to be instituted, uh, you know, by governmental power. And I don't. And certainly, uh, Metaxas is not saying that it should. I'm not. I'm not addressing his book at this point. I'm just saying that I don't think it's the place of secular governments, and this is a secular country, uh, to enforce any particular religious norms. I think by giving. Uh, people freedom to reach their own conclusions uh, the government does exactly what God does God gives us freedom to reach those conclusions and uh, to follow our conscience and of course if we reach wrong conclusions there are consequences for it but the government should not be the one who punishes us for our uh, our conscience or our, our Christian ideas or our religious ideas even if they're religious ideas I don't agree with I think that everyone should have the right to reach their own conscience held convictions because uh, if they were forced, uh, you know, as it were, by law 
to become Christians. They would not become Christians except in name only, many of them. And I don't think the church is, is improved by having an increase of people in it who are Christians in name only. I think the church would be greatly improved if everyone who was, in Christian, who was Christian in name only would leave the churches and the churches would simply be Christians. Uh, that, that would be a big improvement. So, uh, but anyway, there are Christians in our government and they need to know how to govern. And, and there's a, a, quite a unique situation in our country that didn't exist in biblical times, and that is that we are, as voters, as people who choose our own leaders, we are kind of the ones who are in government. You know, the people that we consider government officials are really just public servants, supposedly. This is supposedly a government of the people, by the people, for the people. And it's a, the first government that was ever set up that way. But it's, it makes it somewhat different than, uh, let's just say, the stewardship of citizenry for a Christian is somewhat different than in any other government where the Christians just have to grin and bear it if they have bad government. You know, the early Christians had no say over how Caesar governed them or their, their oppressors governed them. They, they, they didn't have any stewardship over the governance of, the, of the, their nation because they had no power and no, no uh, opportunity. But but when right. Christians have been given special opportunities, and let's just not even say governmental, let's just say, let's say a Christian has more money than the average person. Well, that's a greater stewardship. He's, he's got more responsibility to whom much is given of them much is required, Jesus, or Paul said, uh, or Jesus said, excuse me. And so, you know, to have more opportunity to do good or, or bad means that we have more responsibility to do good in that situation. Now, I, you know, I don't think Christians in America should be uh, lobbying to have Christianity made to be a state religion. But I think Christians in America should be a voice for justice and for righteousness because that's what we stand for. That's what God stands for. And we are kind of in the position, I mean, because we are the, we are the ones who govern. The, the citizenry is the governing, well, are the rulers. And the people we elect, they think they're the rulers, but they're not supposed to. If they understood the Constitution, they'd realize that they are actually the servants of the people who elect them. And therefore, the ones who elect them are the ones with power and therefore responsibility. So I would think that our, our voice, at the very least, our voice, and in many cases, our vote, may be uh, a stewardship responsibility. So um, for us to speak out against evils, I think our, our first responsibility is to speak out against the evils in the church. Paul said, what do I have to do with judging those who are outside the church? You know, God judges those. Uh, and uh -huh. and Paul, Paul didn't really have any, any role in judging the sinful behavior of the pagans in society. He didn't have any governing power. He couldn't, he couldn't affect the policies of the Romans or anything like that. But, but if he had, I suspect he would have probably, for example... Uh, encourage if Christians were voting for things in his day in the Roman era probably, probably Paul would have encouraged them to vote against gladiatorial games you know or uh, oh, yeah. you know, or, or a lot of other wicked things or even feeding Christians to lions you know I think there are things that that Paul and the Christians would have no doubt exercised their political power to try to eliminate if they had political power, we, we can't say for sure, but we know that what power mm -hmm. they did have, they used. They spoke against evil, um, you know, they spoke out against evil, and if you can speak out against evil, and then you're also given, let's say, a vote, um, then I would suggest that that's an, uh, an extra opportunity to, to vote against evil. So I think, I, don't, I, I think Christians who live in a land where the citizenry of which they are a part bears responsibility for the uh, choice of leaders and in some measure therefore the choice of the laws that are made by legislators I think Christians uh, you know that opportunity we could see it as a gift of God but we'd also have to see it as a burden from God that many nations many Christians never had because they never had opportunity they had no responsibility but I think we have more because we have more opportunity it's a greater stewardship I think Okay, I appreciate it. Thank All you. All right, brother. God bless you. Thanks for your call. Uh, Jay from Loomis, California. Welcome to the Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hey, Steve. Hey, uh, I don't remember what verse it is in Ezekiel, but it's the one where um, 
allegedly everyone's describing it as Satan, timbrels and pipes, and he fell yeah, from heaven. That, and all that's that. Ezekiel twenty-eight, twelve, and following. Yeah. Okay. Um, something just kind of dawned on me. I don't know if it's kind of an elementary <clears throat> question, but the title of that verse or chapter. Why? I mean, it clearly says like a message to Tyre, uh, the king of Tyre, or, or something mm-hmm. rather. Yeah, yeah. Um, how accurate is that title, and who has the power to title it as that? Okay. And if, well, if you- and if so, why are people ignoring the title? You know, if if. Um, All right. All right. Well, if uh, first of all, if you have a Bible that has titles in it over the chapters or over different paragraphs, those titles are not actually in the Bible itself. That's just a that's just a convenience that the publishers have added. They uh, it's not part of the text. It's not part of what Ezekiel wrote. For example, when I look at my Bible, I'm looking at New King James here. Ezekiel 28 above the above the chapter says proclamation against the king of Tyre. And when you get to verse 11, there's a title over that that says Lamentation for the King of Tyre. Now, those, those words, those titles are not written by Ezekiel. They're not really part of the Bible. They're not in the manuscripts. Those are simply uh, publishers have put those in to make it a little easier for someone to find uh, a subject or to know when they're going into a chapter what that chapter's going to be addressing. Uh, Bibles don't need those. Um, you know, you don't have to have those. My old King James Bibles never had those. Um, and, and for the most part, um, you know, I, I agree with, with what they say, because usually the titles, you know, are based on what's really in the chapter. And so let's, let's just say, let's just forget about those titles because they're not really part of the Bible and to ignore them is not to be, uh, to do any irreverence. However, it's easy enough to see when you read the chapter itself that it's a proclamation against the king of Tyre. Uh, not only uh, not only chapter 28, but chapter 26 and chapter 27 are also chapters against Tyre, against the city of Tyre, which was north of Israel. It was Phoenicia. And um, so, you know, people may ignore the titles. In some cases, they may not have the titles in their Bibles because they might be reading a Bible put out by a different publisher that didn't put them in there. But but the titles are not original with the book. But you'd think that someone reading Ezekiel 28, just reading the first verses, would say, it says, the, Lord, uh, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God. And then you begin to have this prophecy against, as it says, the prince of Tyre. And in verse 12, it says, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. And say to him, thus says the Lord, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty, and so forth. And, and as you said, this is the passage which people very commonly will apply to Satan. Now, you asked why, when they do that, why do they ignore the fact that it's a, a prophecy to the king of Tyre? Uh, well, they do that because they've been told to do that. They're, you know, their teachers and their pastors have told them this is a prophecy about the origin of Satan. Not one thing in the Bible tells us that it's about that and therefore no Christian is obligated to hold that view but if that's all you've been taught you're probably going to read that view through that template and you're going to see in this a a passage about Satan even though there's no mention of Satan in it Um, and I don't do that anymore in this passage I, I you know we always have to be aware of how many things we're reading into the Bible when we read a, a familiar passage, which aren't really there. And it takes a long time. I'm, I'm still probably in the process of recognizing uh, just, you know, occasionally that some passage I've always thought meant something really doesn't say that. And I was only taught that it meant that, so, which means I have to rethink it. Now, why do those people who do say this is about Satan, why do they say that when in fact, the passage says it's about the king of Tyre. Well, they would say, well, okay, it, uh, it is about maybe the king of Tyre. M- most of this prophecy, chapter 26, 27, 28, all of it is said to be about Tyre and the king of Tyre and so forth. But when you get to verse 12 and following, they say, it's no longer thinking of the king of Tyre, even though it says it is. It's really thinking of the king or the principality behind the king of Tyre. 
Uh, and they might appeal, for example, to Daniel chapter 10, where Daniel is told there's demonic principalities behind Persia and Greece, uh, and therefore, and, and so they would say, well, this might be the demonic principality, or Satan himself, the demonic force behind the king of Tyre. Well, it might be, but there's not anything in the Bible that would even give us any justification for suggesting it. The thing is, there are times when a Bible passage might might you know look beyond its immediate context and have other meanings, perhaps deeper meanings or additional meanings or something. But um, but you can't say that's the case unless you find something in the passage or some other biblical passage talking about that passage, which gives you justification for doing that. In this passage, we have none. There's absolutely none. There's nothing in this passage that mentions Satan. There's nothing in the passage that requires that we take it to be about Satan. The passage itself says it's about the king of Tyre, and the king of Tyre has been discussed in the previous chapters as the ordinary king of Tyre. So, uh, you know, I would say, when you say, well, why do they ignore the fact that it says it's about the king of Tyre? Well, I don't know if they fully ignore it. I think they discount it. I think they say, oh, yeah, well, it, it says it's about the king of Tyre, but it, in this case, it's not talking about the... Uh, the uh, human king of Tyre, but the spiritual satanic king uh, behind the king of Tyre. Now, again, there's not the slightest justification for doing this. There's no. This is not exegesis of the passage. This is eisegesis. This is reading into the passage what you want to see there. And it's not legitimate. Uh, so, and, and even the passage itself doesn't really allow it, because as he's condemning this king of Tyre, he talks about how he was corrupted and he says he was uh, corrupt, in verse 16, says he was corrupted by the abundance of his trading. Now, that's what the city of Tyre was famous for. It was a merchant city. It was a port city. It was became wealthy by commerce. And he's saying, basically, you became corrupted by your commerce, the abundance of your commerce. Well, can we say that about, the, about Satan? Was Satan corrupted because he ran a business and got, you know, and adopted uh, corrupt business practices I, I you know who would, who would argue for that in other words the passage itself does not even allow that it's talking about satan but uh even if one could say well it might mean both or there's something deeper well okay show me why i should think so uh and then maybe i'll consider it but i'm you know everyone can have a theory about things but I, you know there's a zillion theories about everything i'm not interested in theories unless they can be shown in scripture and in this case they cannot. And so that's that's why this is this way. Oh, okay. Wouldn't you say that's a little irresponsible to kind of like, if, if most preachers kind of ignore? Cause I'd let you say the New Living Translation for this instance or something. You know, something rather modern. Um, yeah. Why? I just find it so, so strange that someone would just kind of ignore it but but it, it, like well i see it this way and this is what it is well yeah well, well let me just say this. Not, let me just say this. this illustrates the strength of tradition in reading the bible if we've been taught certain traditions then we read them into the bible and if we say well i can't see why why people say this is about that then many times we'll just defer to them and say well probably they know more about it than i do there, there's probably some things they know that i don't know and then when you find out when you study it out and you know more about it than they do, you realize that they didn't have any reason for it except tradition. And tradition is a hard thing to peel off of your religious uh, theology. Uh, I mean, that's, of course, something that Luther uh, locked horns with the Roman Catholics about, is that they had a lot of traditions that are not in the Bible. But, of course, that doesn't mean that because Protestants broke free from that, that they don't have any traditions of their own. Protestants certainly do, and not all of them are in the Bible. This is one of them. But it's a very ancient tradition, because Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 both were apparently applied to Satan by very early Christian teachers. I believe it goes back at least to Tertullian, if I'm not mistaken, which is very early. And uh, so somebody a long time ago decided this is probably talking about Satan. And I guess, you know, most readers ever since have thought, I guess maybe 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 it was maybe it is about him, but uh, you know when you actually do an exegetical study of it. And by the way, the church fathers are not well known for doing exegesis. Uh, as you read their quotations of scripture, 
in their writings, uh, uh, which I have read a fair amount of them, they do not exegete scripture, generally speaking. They generally make a point that they think is true, and then they'll quote a scripture to make that point. They proof text. And in many cases, they proof text by pretty much ignoring the context or by making assumptions about a passage that are not anywhere justified in the passage. And, and that's, Christians have done that for a very long time. But if we want to really understand what God said and what he meant, we need to move in the direction of being more exegetical. Exegetical means you're reading from the passage only what can be gotten from it in its context and its language. Uh, eisegesis is the practice of reading into the passage ideas that are not in it, but which you want to find there. And so eisegesis is often done. I mean, any time uh, a religious denomination is de defending one of their traditions and trying to do so biblically, they have to eisegete it if it's not what the Bible actually teaches. They read it into a passage. But... Um, you know, if, if, if they exegete it, that means they're trying to read out of the passage only what's there and not, not more. And that's what I try to do. I mean, everyone has the tendency to read into passages, things they think should be there. But, but uh, it's been my commitment to exegete passages for a long time. And that, and that has meant that I've had to give up a lot of the traditional ideas, including this one. Uh, I used to think this was about Satan, too. That's what I was taught until I studied it and found out there's not a reason in the world to think that it is. Not the slightest. Anyway, thank you for your call. I appreciate it. We need to go to another caller. Jimmy from Staten Island, New York. Jimmy, welcome. Thanks for hey, calling. Hey, Steve. I called Hi. you last week. I would yes. like to explore. How you doing? Good. Good. I'd like to explore this uh, thought that you have that faith is not a work. And I have a yes. couple of verses I would like for you to consider. And John 6? Uh, what's that? John 6. This is the work of God that you believe in him. What do you said? read in my mind? No, I've read, I've read all the Calvinists. I've debated Calvinists. I know all their proof texts. Every, every verse you've ever brought up, I've known before. I've known that so, as an argument for your position. Yeah. So if that's genitive, that's very good on you, very insightful. Um, so if this is genitive, the work of God, it's God's work that we believe on him. Now, it, it says here, um, in t well, going back to uh, 27, work not for the meat which, you know, this which perisheth it, which perisheth. And in verse 28, they said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? It's the same word, work and labor, or girds of mine. And uh, Jesus answered and said, this is the work of God. And uh, I read it as saying, this is God's work that you believe on him. Because the, the next verse they say, what sign do you show us then that we may see and believe? And he just got finished in verse 28 saying you saw you seek me not because you saw the miracles Simeon but because you did eat of loaves and were filled and now they're asking for another sign but they already saw the sign but they didn't really comprehend it and when you get down to um, uh, where does it say Jesus said unto them I am the bread of life he that cometh to me shall never hunger and he that believeth unto me shall never thirst so I understand this is nobody can believe in him, believe into him. It's a preposition. It means into. And it's, it shows progression. And if you go back here, I see in verse 29 the work of God. We believe, but it's only because he gives us faith, which is a fruit of the Spirit. And okay, let me jump in because we're, gonna, we're coming up on a hard break here, and I, I want to be able to respond if I can. Uh, yeah, we don't really need all that Greek because the English is pretty clear. It's true, the Greek sometimes solves unclear things, but when the English is relatively clear, a lot of times going to the Greek is superfluous. The fact is, um, Jesus said that you must labor for the food that doesn't perish rather than the food that does perish. So work means labor. Labor that he tells them to do. He's not saying God will do it. He tells them they should labor for the food that does not perish. And they said, what shall we do that we may work the works of God or labor, do the labor we're talking about that God wants me to do? And he says, well, this is the work of God, in this case, the labor. The labor God wants you to do, the only thing he's asking you to do is to believe in him. And they said, well, show us a sign so we can believe in you. Now, they were not understanding him to say, God is going to put faith in you, therefore your faith is God's work in you. Uh, in fact, that's the opposite. He says, you need to labor. 
to do to to earn the food that per doesn't perish. And they said, well, what do we have to do? What is the works of God? What is the labor that, that gains this? So the labor that gains that is believing. Now, it, although it sounds perhaps as he's saying that faith is a work, he's just borrowing their language. He's basically saying you need to obtain. It's like when Jesus in Revelation says uh, to the church of Laodicea, I counsel you to buy from me gold tried in the fire and, and garments of white that you don't be found naked and so forth. Buy it from me. Well, he's not really selling it. He's just basically speaking to them as a, a merchant people, saying you need to be obtaining at whatever price you need to these things from me. And so Jesus is also saying, you want to obtain the meat that perishes. You should seek to obtain the, the, the meat that doesn't perish. And they say, well, what do we have to do to do that? He says, well, you've got to just believe. Now, it's true he uses the word work. He's borrowing the word that they used, and which is they borrowed, they, they used work, work to refer to his previous reference to labor. But the point they're making is he's saying, don't be buying only the food that perishes. You need to purchase or obtain or work for whatever you have to do. You have to get this other kind of food. And they say, how do we do that? He says, you got to do it by believing. Hey, I need to take a break. I'm sorry. You're listening to The Narrow Path. We have another half hour coming up. Our website's thenarrowpath.com, and I'll be back in 30 seconds. In the series, When Shall These Things Be?, you'll learn that the biblical teaching concerning the rapture, the tribulation, Armageddon, the Antichrist, and the millennium are not necessarily in agreement with the wild sensationalist versions of these doctrines found in popular prophecy teaching and Christian fiction. The lecture series entitled, When Shall These Things Be?, can be downloaded without charge from our website, thenarrowpath.com. Welcome back to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. Uh, my name is Steve Gregg, and we're live for another half hour taking your calls. If you'd like to ask a question or disagree with the host on the air, feel free to call this number, 844. Well, I should have said our lines are full, but try to call this number in a few minutes. Maybe one will open up. 844-484-5737. And uh, I was talking to Jimmy from Staten Island just before the break, and, uh, and, he, and he hung up. Uh, which is, is fine because we need to move on anyway. But uh, I just wanted to say, uh, Jimmy calls from time to time, and he's, and he's a, a Calvinist, and he always brings a case for Calvinism. I just want to say positively about him. He always comes prepared. When he calls, he knows what scriptures he wants to talk about. Uh, he knows what point he wants to make, and he brings it right up front, and I appreciate that. I think that when people call with their questions, and especially if they disagree, that it's good for them to clarify right from the beginning. Okay, this is what I want to talk about. This is where I disagree, uh, can, you know, and so forth. So I want to I want to commend Jimmy for that. He he always has uh, called quite prepared, and uh, he's been calling for some time now. But anyway, um, it it's it's actually kind of a, a a relief to have people call who are right up front about what they want to talk about, and so. Uh, it's better than kind of beating around the bush like some people do. And and some people call, and then when I put it on the air, they can't even, uh, that's when they start thinking about what their question is. Or that's when they start looking for the verse they want to talk about, right? You know, they're on, they're on hold for 10 minutes before I put them on, and then when I put them on, then they start looking for a verse. Uh, so, I mean, I, I just want to say Jimmy is a prepared guy. He definitely is a, a Bible student, and I appreciate uh, his calls, even though he always, you know, is on the other side of the aisle from where I am. Uh, J.C. from Chandler, Arizona. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Good afternoon, Steve. It's always a pleasure to be part of the program and a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. I have a, I have a question and then a little bit of information. You have folks that call in occasionally, and uh, the topic of 12-step uh, uh, programs and substance mm -hmm. abuse comes up. And I wanted to uh, give you a little more information. For example... Uh, my ministry here, Blessed and Bold, um, I work with young men mostly who are struggling with the substance abuse, and God's hand is all over the 12 steps. For example, um, my focus is on the third step, which is turn your life and your will over to the care of God. And most young men um, don't have any concept of who God is at all. And 
making them or, or giving them information that allows them to understand that they stay sober by the grace of God um, is, uh, is, is uh, you know, it's an opportunity. You know, I, I don't consider myself an evangelist, but it's an opportunity to, to present and educate them on that. And it's, uh, it, it's refreshing. But my question in, you know, it's a bit elementary, but um, there's several instances in the Bible where um, it's said that no one can see God and, and live. Um, but, you know, and I understand Abraham, you know, God had to put him to sleep, but there's some confusing verses which indicate that at some point uh, men have seen God. Can, can you help clear that up a little bit for me? I think so, yeah. Um, one of the, I mean, John is usually the one who says that no one has seen God at any time, although uh, actually, of course, in the Old Testament, Moses was told he couldn't see God's face and live. But um, in John chapter 1, it actually says, you know, no man has seen God at any time, but uh, the only begotten Son, uh, you know, has uh, declared him to us. And, and uh, who's the Son who's in the bosom of the Father, that's, that's John uh, 1, 18. No, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son uh, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And then this same affirmation that no one has seen God at any time is also found in John's other, uh, his epistle, his first epistle, 1 John 4, 9. He says no man has seen God at any time. Now, um, yet we do read multiple times in the Old Testament people have seen God. And even John, who makes this statement in John 1, 14, just four verses earlier, he said the word became flesh. And he's already said that the word was God in the opening verse of the book. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld. That's what we looked at. We saw His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, John has said that the Word was God. Then the Word became flesh in Christ, and we saw Him. But no one has seen God at any time. Now, how, how does that work? Uh, John is personally the one, more than any other Old Te New Testament writer probably, that, that affirms that Jesus is God in the plainest terms, and yet he's the one who says no one has seen God, and yet he says we've seen Jesus. In fact, in First John chapter one, he says that you know that which we have seen and heard, referring to Jesus of the Word of Truth, we declare unto you. So, how do how, how did he? I mean, obviously he makes these statements about this in this in the very same chapter so within verses of each other. So he must either be schizophrenic or he doesn't mean seeing God in the same sense in both cases. And that would not be too surprising because there's a sense in which even the Old Testament speaks of seeing God in different senses. When, when Moses said, Lord, show me your glory, God said to him, no one can see my face and live. And yet we read later on that when he rebuked Aaron and Miriam, God said, you know, if I raise up a prophet, I'll speak to him in dream or vision or dark saints, but my servant Moses is not so. He speaks with me face to face, you know, and the likeness of the Lord he beholds. So there's a sense in which Moses does see God. In fact, in uh, chapter uh, 19 of uh, Exodus, before the law was given, 70 elders of Israel went up on the mountain with Moses, and it says they saw the God of Israel. Isaiah chapter 6 says, I saw the Lord in the year King Uzziah died, uh, I saw the Lord high and lived up and his train filled the temple when Jacob wrestled with a man all night at the end of that he said I have uh, seen God face to face and my life is preserved and, and therefore he named the place uh, face of God uh, so you know there's there's quite a few places in the Bible that people say they saw God and 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 it says that people saw God so what does it mean when it says that God can't, no one can see God's face and live. No one has seen God at any time. Certainly those uh, u universal statements must be referring specifically to, you know, what, what Moses asked for when he said, Lord, show me your glory. And God said, you can't, no one can see my face and live. To see God's unveiled glory is something that humans apparently could not tolerate at this point. When Jesus returns in glory, will be glorified also and we'll be able to see God uh, and live, you know, and, and see him face to face and all of that without any problem. But apparently in our mortal bodies, 
it's not possible for us to see the unveiled glory of God. It's too intense. Just like you can't look at the solar eclipse that's coming uh, with your naked eye. It'll burn your eyeballs out if you do. You're going to have to have some kind of special glasses or something to, to see it safely. So the glory of God is so intense that it says, actually, when Jesus comes back in glory, it's going to incinerate the world. It says the, in Revelation 20, verse 11, it says when he, see, when he comes, it says that uh, the heavens and the earth will flee away because there are no more place for them. In, in 1 Thessalonians, it says in verse uh, 1, 8, uh, 1 8, I think it is 2 Thessalonians 1 8, he says that Jesus will come in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who don't obey God. And in, in the next chapter, it says that he will destroy the, the man of sin by the brightness of his appearing or of his glory. So, I mean, God's glory, once it's unveiled, is quite destructive to physical realities uh, until, uh, until we are glorified, too, in our bodies. But God has nonetheless veiled his glory on occasion and revealed himself through Jesus. For example, Jesus' body... Which, in which God dwelt, in, in Hebrews chapter 10 is referred to as the veil, the veil of his flesh. Um, th th that that when, when Jacob wrestled with a man, or when others seemed to see God in what we call theophanies, these were cases where God was apparently wearing a, a veil uh, of, of, a, of a physical form so that they weren't looking on his unveiled glory they're seeing him manifesting himself in a physical form which you know apparently in some way shades their shades their eyes from the intensity of the glory now when isaiah said i saw the lord high and lifted up in his train for the temple i believe we're to understand that was a vision uh the prophets had visions in fact isaiah the, the book of isaiah begins with the words the vision of isaiah the son of amos so the book of Isaiah, is, the whole thing is called the vision. So, I, and there are times when prophets see visions of God. Uh, they're not looking at God straight on. Again, they're not looking at the unveiled glory of God, but there, there's a visual representation presented to their minds. I consider, vi I, I've never had a vision like this, but I, I consider visions in the Bible to be very similar to dreams. The difference being that when you dream, you're asleep, and when people had visions, uh, they were awake. But apart from whether they're awake or asleep, I think a vision and a dream are very similar. Uh, in a dream, you might see any number of people who aren't literally there in your head. Uh, you might even have God. You might even see God in a dream, as Daniel did, for example, in Daniel chapter 7. Um, you know, God might be a character in the dream, or if you're not asleep, in a vision. But that's something that's, that's, something that's being presented to your mind. By God, if it's a, if it's a you know if it's a divinely inspired vision or dream, it's something that God is impressing on the mind, in which a visual representation of God is being registered. But but you're not looking at God directly. So when the Bible talks about seeing God, it's not always talking about the same thing. When the Bible says no man is seeing God at any time, I think this must mean, in the sense that God told Moses, no one can see me and live. God cannot reveal himself to us without veiling his glory at the, in our present mortal uh, life. But he can reveal himself to us that through visions or theophanies or perhaps uh, dreams or whatever, he can, he can appear, uh, or at least we can be said to see him. Uh, and, and so that's what I believe is why there's different testimony on that particular thing. It's not, I mean, like I said, we could say, well, that sounds contradictory, but it seems very strange to say that John, who is not uh, a mental case, would say in one verse that they saw the glory of God in Christ, and then f four verses later say no one has seen God at any time. So within within the space of a few verses to contradict would not be something a sane man would do. So I think we have to assume that seeing God in one case uh, actually refers to a different phenomenon than the other case. I appreciate your call. Let's talk to Sergio from Maricopa, Arizona. Hi, Sergio. Good to hear from you. Hey, Steve. Uh, my question is, uh, in 1 Corinthians 10, um, verse 4, it speaks about Christ being the rock which was struck by Moses and the water came out. And I see that as a typology in uh -huh. the Gospels and the crucifixion um, when Christ was pierced on the side and water came out. Uh, what is the water precisely, or I guess the, 
the typological um, value that's there. Sure. Well, what Paul's doing in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 5, is enumerating uh, a series of events that occurred, of, or experiences that the Israelites occurred, uh, experienced through the Exodus. Uh, it, he mentions that they all uh, passed through the cloud and the sea, and he says they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. That's referring, I think, probably to the water baptism. He says they were baptized into Moses through the sea. That going through the Red Sea is a type and a shadow of Christians being baptized. The cloud being the presence of God, perhaps the Spirit of God, he says were baptized in the sea and in the cloud, were baptized in water and in the Holy Spirit. So I think that represents that. Then he says they all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Uh, but in the previous, uh, verse 3 I skipped over, it says they ate the same spiritual food. Now, of course, he's referring to their, the natural food they ate. They ate manna, which was physical. It wasn't spiritual in the sense of non-physical, but it was called spiritual food. And spiritual drink, the water. Now, the food they ate and the drink, the water they drank was just, you know, physical. It nourished their physical bodies. But he's saying that these things were unusual food and water because they were provided supernaturally. You know, later on in this same book, in 1 Corinthians 15, he's going to compare our natural bodies with the resurrection bodies. And he's going to say it is sown, that is, the physical body is, is sown when you die and it's buried as a natural body. But when it rises, it's a spiritual body. Now, again, it doesn't mean non-physical because the Bible makes it very clear. Our resurrection bodies are, are physical, but it's so was the spiritual water they drank and the spiritual manna they ate. I mean, the, basically, the spiritual means uh, supernatural. And uh, all this, the, the manna and water they drank was certainly physical, nourishing uh, substance such as they might normally drink or eat. It was supernatural. It was provided supernaturally. The manna was provided from heaven every night, and uh, the water was provided from the rocks supernaturally. Now, that's how Paul means spiritual. Now, what does it refer to? Well, just as passing through the water and the cloud to Paul corresponded with being our being baptized in water and in, in the Holy Spirit, we also share their experience of eating spiritual food, which, of course, is Christ. Remember, Jesus said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my... Uh, my blood yeah, has everlasting life, but we do that. And also, he says we drink the spiritual water. We, I think, we have to assume Paul means by that the Holy Spirit, because Jesus said in John seven verses uh, thirty-seven through thirty-nine, he said, uh, Wh "Whoever thirsts, let him come to me and drink." Uh, and says, "He that believes on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his bowels shall flow rivers of living water." And it's, John says, this he spoke of the Holy Spirit, uh, who would be given. So the living water is the Holy Spirit. And so Paul, what Paul is doing is saying that we have had, as Christians, experiences that are typologically foreshadowed in Israel's experiences. They pass through water. We do, too, and we're baptized. They were guided by the, the, the cloud. We, too, are guided by the Holy Spirit. Uh, they ate food that God provided to nourish them. We also eat of Christ and, and receive eternal life. They drank water that God provided, spiritual water. Well, we drink the living water of the Holy Spirit. Now, the reason Paul's making all these points is to say, and he goes on after verse 6 to say, but even though they had all these experiences, which correspond in, in type to ours as Christians, they, some of them died under God's judgment because they worshipped idols, and they committed fornication, did things they, that, that were not okay. And so verses uh, 7 through 10, he goes and talks about the, the mistakes they made and how God wiped out a whole generation in the wilderness. So, and then he's, in both cases, when he, when he lists the advantages they had, which are similar to ours, he summarizes them in verse 6 as, these things were types of us. I think many Bibles say were examples for us, but actually in the Greek it's tupas, Two boy, it's the, they are types. That their their experience of salvation was a type of our experience of salvation. But then, after he warns about how many of them were wiped out for their sins, in verse eleven he says, "These things also were types for us." So the point he's making is, 
uh, don't be too cocky about some kind of unconditional eternal security. These people had the same or had salvation experiences that corresponded with the salvation experience we've had. And yet, when they fell away, they fell under God's judgment and were destroyed. And he says, well, that's a type for us, too. So, and, and then, of course, Paul, that's in the context of 1 Corinthians 8 through 10. Paul is talking about eating meat sacrifice to idols, and he's arguing basically that uh, Christians ought to stay out of the idol temples, lest they be drawn back into idolatry, and lest they stumble weaker brothers in doing so. So he's warning them against idolatry. And he's pointing out that the Israelites got destroyed because of their idolatry, but they had had experiences previous to that that correspond to the experiences we've had in being saved. So that's that's the point he's making there. And the water that he's talking about is, in fact, the uh, uh, you know the water out of the rock. But I think it corresponds with the, the living water, which is the Holy Spirit that we have. I hope that helps. Let's talk to Cody from Baytown, Texas. Hi, Cody. Hi, good afternoon, Steve Greg. I'm fine. How you doing? Hey, well, thank you. Hey, my question regards uh, to what Matthew t uh, or what Jesus and Matthew said to the apostles in uh, 24 uh, 30 when he said, uh -huh. "Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven." Um, what do you think that uh, sign is? You know, this is the only time in the Bible that the expression "the sign of the Son of Man in heaven" is found, and and the word order is different in certain versions, which changes up the possible meaning. For example, in Matthew twenty four thirty, in the New King James, it says, "Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven." Okay, so the words "will appear" are placed just before the words "in heaven," which suggests that there's a sign in heaven that would be seen on earth of the Son of Man. Now this, you know, you're right to wonder what it's talking about because it actually is a distinctive separate from the actual coming of Christ. Because it goes on to say, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. So first they see the sign of the Son of Man appearing in heaven and then they uh, mourn and then they see the Son of Man himself coming. So this is really a bit confusing because we don't have any other reference to the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. But um, the King James Version puts the word order differently, which is entirely possible to do, and gives a slightly different idea. Instead of saying, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, it says, then shall us appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Now, how is that different? Because when that wording does not say the sign will appear in heaven, it is a sign that the Son of Man is in heaven. It says, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. So instead of saying that the sign will be in heaven, it's saying the sign will, will show that the Son of Man is in heaven. Now, the Son of Man in heaven is a reference that goes back to Daniel chapter 7 and verse uh, 13 and 14, I think it is, or 12 and 13, where Daniel says, I saw one like a son of man uh, coming in the clouds of heaven, and he came to the Ancient of Days, it says. And it says, and they brought him before him, that is, they brought the Son of Man before God. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. Now, some people see this as a reference to the second coming of Christ, but Daniel doesn't. Daniel sees this as the Son of Man coming to heaven. The Son of Man coming to the Ancient of Days. That's the Father in this. And they brought Jesus before the Father. So, Daniel is not on earth seeing the man come back through the clouds in the second coming. Daniel's viewpoint is from heaven itself. He's caught up in the vision to heaven. And he sees Jesus coming to heaven through the clouds. Remember in Acts chapter 1, the disciples watched Jesus disappear into clouds as he ascended. But Daniel sees the other side of the clouds from the above. He sees Jesus coming through the clouds and coming to God and receiving a seat at the right hand of God and being given dominion and a kingdom that everyone, it says, should serve him. And Paul, of course, says that's exactly the way things are now since Jesus ascended. In Ephesians 1, it says that God has given him at the, at the very end of Ephesians 1, says God has given him a name above every name and every dominion and every power. He's, he's above everything. 
And in Philippians 2, Paul says that every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, which is what is said here, that all peoples, nations, and tongues should serve him. Why? Because he's on the throne. Because he's at the right hand of God. And he's going to reign there until he's put all his enemies under his footstool, according to Psalm 110, verse 1, and many places in the New Testament that say the same thing. I quote that verse. So the Son of Man in heaven is is a fulfillment of Daniel 7, 13. The Son of Man ascended to heaven and is seated ever since his ascension and is reigning. Now, what they saw was a sign, perhaps a sign on earth, that the Son of Man is now in heaven. And uh, that would perhaps be saying that the destruction of Jerusalem, which he, a few verses later Jesus said this will happen in this generation, uh, the destruction of Jer Jerusalem happened in 70 AD, and it was seen, and Jesus had predicted it, as something that would happen as a, a vindication of Christ. Christ was the king. They had killed him. But now he's vindicated. Now he's in heaven. Now he's on the throne. And now one of his first, one of his early acts of ruling is to bring uh, a vindication of himself on those who murdered him. And thus they destroy, uh, Jerusalem is destroyed. So it's very possible that they shall then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. The sign that the Son of Man is, is in fact in heaven, as Daniel predicted, is that he has destroyed those who killed him, as he said he would, by the way. There's several references in Christ's teaching to the fact that, uh, you know, this was going to be, this is going to come on Jerusalem because of their killing him. And so that's what I suspect it's talking about. Obviously, there's different views of that particular uh statement but that's that's i think a probably a reasonably good one okay mary from california welcome to the narrow path we're gonna have a couple of minutes yeah good afternoon uh i don't know if i could put um, my question is on number chapter six about nazarian uh verse 13. yeah he the started talking about. yeah he started talking about the corpse will defile a person and then uh, as I read down towards the end to, in the middle it says now this is the law of the Nazarite when the days of the separation are fulfilled is Nazarite a religion like Jews or is Nazarite a, some kind of citizen becoming of a Nazarite yeah you're becoming a Nazarite means you take a vow of the Nazarite. The word Nazarite means separated. And any Jew could take such a vow. Samson was under such a vow all his life. So was Samuel. So was John the Baptist, apparently. And even Paul took a Nazarite vow for a while in uh, Acts 18.18. 18. A Nazarite vow could be taken for a month or more, or for a whole life. And there were three conditions that a Nazarite had to meet. This was a voluntary vow, generally speaking. Anyone could do it if they wished. And they would abstain from uh, contact with dead bodies, that is, with corpses. They would abstain from everything that's a product of the grapevine, which is wine, grapes, raisins, uh, grape juice, whatever. And they would not cut their hair for the whole time of their vow. That's, of course, Samson is most famous for that particular aspect. Now, these restrictions were not imposed except voluntarily on people. And if they wanted to do it, they, then they restricted themselves in this way. And that's what number six is talking about. Now, as far as the symbolism of it, I, you know, the music's playing. I don't have time to go into it in detail. And I'm not sure I could say for sure what the symbolism is. I have. But uh, anyway, that's what it is. A Nazarite was not a, a different race of people. A Nazarite was somebody who took a Nazarite vow. And Jesus was not a Nazarite. He was a Nazarene, which means somebody from Nazareth, an entirely different word. Uh, Hey, I'm out of time. Thanks for calling. You've been listening to The Narrow Path. We are listener-supported. Our website is thenarrowpath.com. Thanks for joining us. Let's talk again tomorrow.